Uh, If you have your Bible, you're welcome to open it up to Acts chapter 5, which I'm excited to jump into together. We'll look at Acts chapter 4 at the very end, but our main chunk is going to be in Acts chapter 5. And so if you're turning your app or your Bible there, that'd be great. And while you're doing that, we have another story of witness I want to share with you this morning of someone in our congregation who shared their story with us. So if you'll turn your heads to the video screen, you'll see a, a great story here as well. My name is Anibal Ruiz, and I grew up in eastern Washington. Uh, My parents immigrated from Mexico, um, strong Catholic background, so I grew up knowing about God, um, knowing about Jesus, uh, but never really actually having an intimate relationship. And it wasn't until um, I was introduced to Young Life uh, by a teacher um, named Anita Quinn, um, who uh, really worked her magic um, in persuasion on getting folks to Uh, support me to attend a Young Life retreat. And it was at that retreat when they did a skit about different things that teens struggled with, drugs, sex, um, things like that. But none of those really related to me until in a part of the skit there was a student who just didn't have time for Christ. She was too busy with schoolwork, too busy with activities. And that really hit home. It was at that point when I realized that it wasn't necessarily a, a, a tear of sins, that if I wasn't doing drugs that I was okay, but that it was really about a relationship with God. And it was at that Young Life camp when I was 18 years old that I finally said, I need to have this relationship and I committed my life to Christ. We all have stories. It's wonderful to know that. If you've come to know Jesus Christ, you have a story of how he saved you by his grace as well. And it's great to hear Annabelle's. And I'm grateful to have other people's stories in here that encourage us and to draw us near to Christ and actually compel us to share the story of Jesus with the world around us as well. Because after all, we are the unbroken chain of witnesses by the power of the Holy Spirit to reach out to the world to the mission of God. Remember that chain we've had? We didn't bring it up here this week because it got too heavy for us. So uh, um, if you've been here, you'll, you'll understand that joke. But there's this chain of people, of this links of people that sharing their stories over and over again. And if you heard Annabelle's story, Annabelle's story, it took someone inviting him to go be a part of Young Life, to be a part of that ministry, to hear the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's a great thing. You have a story. You have a story to share with some, to draw them, someone to draw them into an experience of Christ. And when you do that, who knows what might happen? You might get the opportunity to share with someone and they may accept and receive the Lord Jesus as you are his witness to reach the world. That's our series we're in called Witness in the Book of Acts. And I've been really excited to be in this for the last three weeks. And so this is week number four. And so what we're going to be in today, I think, is probably one of the most difficult passages in the Book of Acts. Um, It seems out of place in the context of the Book of Acts, in fact. Um, And why do I say that? Because I think in Acts 2 through 4, we see really the height of biblical community. Like it's everything's going really well. And the church is growing. God's adding to their numbers daily, those who are being saved. And it's like the quintessential picture of the church of Jesus Christ. And it's like, oh man, this is amazing. Stuff is going on. It's a picture of true biblical unity where the church is living together, sharing together, meeting together, and doing all the things that you kind of want to do in the context of the church. And everything is going right. And then we're seeing the heights of those things. And then all of a sudden we come to Acts chapter 5 and, and things change pretty dramatically and pretty suddenly. And, uh, well, you'll, you'll just see what I mean. Let's read a bit together in Acts 4 and see what happens here. And if you can see what happens is out of place as I think it is, I, I think you'll be shocked to see what happens in the midst of the early church. Let's start at the end of verse, chapter 4. And, uh, and we'll start in verse 32, and, and I'll show you this height of biblical community, and then we'll jump into a pretty crazy story. So it says this in Acts 4.32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, who was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias with his Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, kept back for himself some of the proceeds, and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, 
Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not then at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out, and then they buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for for so much. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will now carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Whoa. First thing I think of is, you young men in the church, you have a pretty rotten job, man. Someone dies, like you get to carry him out and bury him. That's your role, right? So there you go. So I was reading the scripture this week, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what are you going to say about something like this? It just seems out of context for all the amazing things that are happening within the book of Acts. And all of a sudden you get this story which just stands in stark contrast to all that stuff. In fact, friends, I, I think that's what Luke's trying to do. He's trying to give us stark contrast. I mean, he tells us in verse 33 of chapter 4 that great grace was upon them all. Do you see that phrase? I like that phrase. Like if I could identify a church some way, if someone said and described our church, I would hope they would say, man, great grace is on that church and through that church. It's a great description of the church, and it's something I would long for as our church. But then twice in chapter 5, once in verse 5 and then once again in verse 11 that we just read, it says that great fear came upon the entire church. So there's a contrast here, great grace and great fear. This is a description that, the Luke, that Dr. Luke gives us of the early church. And what's happening here is this is holy awe of things that's happening. There's great grace and there's great fear. And I think it creates something in the early church of urgency and kind of a sense of like what is going to happen next. Can you imagine that? I mean, people knew Ananias and Sapphira. These weren't just unknown people within the context of the church. They had friends. They had people that hung out. They probably had small group at each other's houses, probably shared needs together as we see. And, and all of a sudden this happens. And this didn't just happen in theory, but it happened in fact. People were able to look out and say, oh man, did you hear about Ananias and Sapphira? You hear what happened to them? Can you imagine that moment? Think about this. The resurrection of Jesus is still only three to four months prior at most. Pentecost had happened two months before this event. The church is growing. Things are going amazing. So we have all these ups and suddenly we have a down as well. These are the people in the church that passed away in some strange and unique way. Why would it happen? That's the big question. We'll get there. Are you intrigued? I kind of am. Let's keep reading and see what happens next in Acts Four, or excuse me, let's, uh, let's read Acts 4.32. Oh, excuse me, actually, I want to I stop there. I want to pause for just a second and not do that yet. But I want to think about what we're going to do in the early church in Acts. I want to stop before we get to Ananias and Sapphira and talk about Acts 4.32 and following. And just think about the early church first. We didn't cover this in Acts chapter 2. Because I think when I did that, it's so common to know this scripture in Acts 2 that we all think about that. But it's amazing how Acts 2 in the end of that actually talks about the same thing that happens in Acts 4 as well. And it's this picture of the early church. So before we get to the, the bad contrast, let's talk about the good contrast for what's happening here. My assumption when I think about what's happening here is this is not easy. Because if you look at what happens in Acts 4.32, we think it sounds amazing, but these people are selling their possessions and bringing it to the apostles. They're giving up of their own property. They're doing everything they can to sacrifice for one another. Which sounds amazing in theory until you realize that you might have to do that as well, right? And then it's like, yeah, that's awesome. Everyone loves giving up their stuff. And then suddenly you're like, oh man, do I, do I have to do that as well? Because that's what's happening in the context of the early church. People are so compelled by the mission of God that they decide to give and share with one another to help God build his church and to work alongside the power of the Holy Spirit. So they hold all things in common, their possessions, their lands, their property, the financial resources. My assumption on this is that this is not easy. When the Bible says here in Acts 4.32 that they were of one heart and soul, I think we think that is just something they did. But I would venture to say that it took a ton of work 
from each and every person to make this possible. And this is kind of a lesson for us as we think about the church. Because in theory, we want the church to be as excellent as we see in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. But then when it gets down to it, it's hard to do those things. It takes work on our behalf. And it makes it so that you have to take part in this to be of one heart and one soul. Now, if I can work a U2 sermon illustration into a sermon, I, I tend to do that. So I have to do this real quick here. On their album, Actung Baby, which was released in 1991, U2 had a song that was called One. It's become one of the most famous songs ever. It's been played at almost every concert since that day that they've ever done. And the five or so times that I've seen U2, they've always done the song One. It's an amazing song, and it's one that we could all sing along to, and it's just an amazing thing because it has a great picture of caring for one another, of loving one another, and all that kind of stuff. And we tend to think that song is a positive song. But if you want to hear something crazy, that song is not a positive song in Bono's mind. In fact, Bono wrote that song because the band was breaking up. Did you know that? I, I, I found that out a few weeks ago, and I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. But they were struggling so much as a band, they were trying to find their sound, and there was arguments between The Edge and Adam and Larry, who's their drummer, and they were freaking out together. And so Bono came up with this song called One. And he said, we've sung this song over positive vibes all throughout the history of our concert. But the funny thing is, he goes, people don't get it. People don't understand that one was actually written out of intense struggle together. He actually writes this about the song one. He goes, there's a melancholy about the song, but there's also a strength. One is actually not about oneness, it's about difference. It's not the old hippie idea, let's, let's all live together. It's much more of a punk rock concept. It's anti-romantic. We are one, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other. It's a reminder that we have no choice, he says. He says, I'm so disappointed when people hear the chorus line as got to rather than we get to carry each other. Like it or not, the only way out of here is if you give you a leg up on the wall, then you pull me up after you. There's something, uh, there's something terribly unromantic about that. This song is twisted, which is why I can never figure out why people want it sung at their weddings. <laughs> <laughs> Because I've certainly met a hundred people who've had it done their weddings, and I tell you, you're mad? This is all about splitting up, not staying together. <laughs> Funny thing is, I read that quote, and I thought about this passage. Actually, I thought about Acts 2 in the first time, and I thought, oh, how difficult is it to stay together? How difficult is it to do this? Now, U2 is a classic. I mean, their band's been together for 30-some years, and they've just been together as this band. And they've gone through ups and downs. And the thing is, I think what we think about this, when we think of this romantic picture of the church, when it says they're one heart and one soul, we just think it comes naturally. But friends, does it come naturally in the church? No, it doesn't. It's difficult. It's difficult to stay together. But the heart of this is a sense of sacrifice, of gratitude, of generosity, of just understanding the part we play in being the church. I think Acts 4, 32, 37, on the positive side of things, when great grace is upon them all, is the hard work of being the church. Now, I understand this. All kinds of questions are raised when you read this. You might say to yourself, man, I read this scripture, and I'm like, is this socialism, or is this social democracy, or something like that? Is the church proceeding to tell me all about that? You might say, is this the Amish? Is this why the Amish do what they do, and they're building their buildings, and they're one, and all that kind of stuff? Or you might even say, is this the church's first social program? And the answer is, I, no, it's not all of those things. There's something different that it's describing here. I mean, even the fact that Luke is not saying there's a criticism for the early church to own their own things. In fact, he's saying quite the opposite here. He's saying that they continued to meet in each other's homes, and they were described as homes belonging to certain people. Furthermore, as you go through the book of Acts, you actually see other people owning homes and the church meeting in these homes. For example, in Acts 12, 12, Luke will describe the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, as her home where the church was meeting in. And so there's a sense of ownership is okay. It's not this sense that we just all of a sudden give up everything we own to be part of the church, but rather there's a sense of sacrifice that's inherent within this passage. And so we see in verse 35, they sold possessions and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they were distributed to each as they had need. And so there's a sense of like, if I have more than I need, or if I see people in need that I'm willing to give up the things that I have to help other people. It's not like the goods were distributed equally in some form of socialism here. That's not what's going on. But rather what's going on is people who have more than others are saying, I can help that person. It's a good word for us in the church today. For many of us have more than other people and we can share and be generous with other people. And the church can be a people that lifts one another up in that way. 
Now, what does that look like exactly for you? I don't know. I don't know the answer. But I do know that it requires something of you in order to help be this one heart and one mind. So we get this guy that's singled out here. This guy named Barnabas. I love this story of what happens here. In fact, he becomes the quintessential picture of generosity. He becomes the person who sells a piece of land that he has and lays it at the apostles' feet. He becomes the antithesis of Ananias and Sapphira that we're going to see in just a second here that I haven't quite jumped into yet. But what's amazing about this guy is his generosity is highlighted, I think, to help compel us to be people a little bit like Barnabas. Now, do you know much about Barnabas? I don't, I don't know if you know or not. Hey, Barnabas, we find out a little bit more later on in Acts. And, and we do know that despite the persecution that the early church was facing, Barnabas was called by the Holy Spirit to eventually go with Paul on a missionary journey. So Barnabas was part of the early church. Things were going as Paul was converted to Christ. We're going to see in a couple chapters here. And God dramatically saved him. Barnabas decided to go with him on a missionary journey. And so he did that. And on the first mission trip they were on, for an unspecified reason we don't see within the context of the trip, we find out there's a man named John Mark who leaves Barnabas and Paul and abandons them in the midst of their journey. And then we find out this, that Paul was angry about the whole thing. He didn't like the fact that John Mark left him, and it frustrated him to no end. And so Barnabas continued on with Paul, and, and uh, he did all kinds of work with him in the context of that trip. But then during the second trip, something pretty amazing happened. Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, Barnabas began to plan another journey together. And then Barnabas comes up to Paul one day and says, Paul, let's take John Mark again. I know, I know he couldn't finish the trip on the last time we were going, but he can do it this time. And what's amazing, you think Paul was like, yeah, that's awesome. We'd love to bring John Mark with us. That was not his response at all. In fact, the Bible says that Paul got angry at Barnabas. And the Bible says so much so that a sharp disagreement arose among Paul and Barnabas so that they separated from one another. Like the, the early church never had any problems, did it, right? <laughs> Here they are. They separate from one another and they're frustrated with one another in Acts chapter 15. Barnabas then, true to his nickname, son of encouragement, takes John Mark at that point with him and decides to disciple him. Paul left and take a man named Silas with him who became his partner of the next couple missionary journeys that he had. What's amazing though is that we find that Barnabas' ministry was so effective in the life of John Mark eventually that John Mark was able to connect with Paul later on in life. We don't know all the details about this, but there's something amazing I want you to find out. We find out here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, at the end of Paul's life, something pretty amazing happens. Because he's writing to Timothy, and he says he wants none other than John Mark to come and be with him. And he wants him because, quote, this is what the Bible says, he is very useful to me, is what he says. Same John Mark who abandoned them during the first missionary journey, who Paul and Barnabas fought about during the second missionary journey, who Barnabas goes with and hangs out with John Mark and disciples him. Something God did in his life is pretty amazing because all of a sudden Paul at the end of his life says, I want John Mark back with me again. Barnabas. This is the Barnabas we see in Scripture. The son of encouragement, the man who brings all he has to the church in his generosity and lays it at the apostles' feet. He doesn't just give of his resources, but he gives of his time. He gives of his ability to disciple this young man, John Mark, so that eventually Paul wants him back again. Our assumption is that Paul and Barnabas got back together again as well, and there was much relationship that happened through that and growth through struggle. But here's the thing. Like Barnabas, you and I are encouraged to be encouragers of the faith, contributors to the church so that it's healthy. Barnabas, I think, is a guy who gets this idea that we talk about at Imprint Church all the time, this idea of gospel and gratitude and generosity, that we're changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, which helps lead us to gratitude, this overwhelming sense of thanksgiving, that we do things because of what Christ has done for us, which leads us to be generous people. And we are to be growing in these things. And that is how the church is healthy, my friends. That's why we have these three G's at Imprint Church. And it's how it would define this one heart and mind. And what would I hope for us as a church community? This is our hope for you as well. That you would be people like Barnabas. And that we'd be willing to be generous. Let me take a quick rabbit trail before we get to the rest of Ananias and Sapphira. I know I set that up and I left you hanging, but I'll get back there in just a second. I have a quick rabbit trail for us. I think I would be amiss if I didn't spend a few minutes talking about how we can be very practically generous as a church. Now, it certainly means with our finances, for one thing. 
And it's one thing I want to talk about. We don't talk about finances a whole lot of here, but it's something I want to bring up this morning to think about. Because, I mean, here you got in the context of Acts chapter 4, people selling their stuff and bringing their finances, bringing their sustenance to the church. And the reason why is because we take an offering every Sunday here at Imprint Church. Now, we don't pass baskets around here. It's not something we do. And part of this was a decision not because we don't want to receive an offering or because we're embarrassed to pass the baskets or something like that. Rather, I thought what was really cool is this idea when we first started that it requires some sacrifice of us to give. And so even to get up out of your seat and walk to the front is a sacrifice on some people's behalf. Like, just being honest, right? Like, I I mean, I had church people, pastors, friends, bigger churches would tell me, you're going to lose money by not passing the baskets. I kid you not, I had people tell me that. I'm like, it's worth it to me. And why is it worth it to me? Because I want to have an attitude of response in our generosity. An attitude like this. I mean, these apostles, these people had to bring their stuff to the apostles and set it there and say, I'm willing to give and be generous here. And I think we want that same attitude as well. And so we have our response time in a few minutes here when the band's going to come back up and sing. We get to come forward and give. And I would encourage you to give generously as God has given so much to you. It's why we have it during our response time. It's why we do this as part of our response in worship. But I want to think about real quick a couple things about giving for you. And this is where I get the rabbit trail, so you guys can follow me for just a second. But I want to think about some principles of giving for you. And you can just kind of put these in the back of your mind if you want to. But things that I want you to understand, because it's not that the church wants your money, okay? This is for you. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but giving is not so you can give to us, so everything's going to be okay. That was never, our, our, our desire was not to start Imprint Church so it would survive for the eons. Like every church in Revelation is not around anymore. Churches eventually will go away. They just will. It, it, it's God's plan. It's God's design when that happens and there's ups and downs in church life. And that's okay. It's even okay for churches sometimes to shut their doors. Those are okay circumstances. Sometimes they don't happen in good circumstances. But it is okay in the plan of God for that to happen. But the reality is it's not about the money at all. The money, the giving, is for your heart. It's for God to get a hold of you to allow you to be generous so that you're not so stuck on things and you're allowing God to speak into your life even in your own possessions. So think about these things. These are adapted from my friend, Pastor Mark Mitchell. And I want to say a couple things about principles of giving here at Imprint Church. The first thing I want you to know is this. Sacrificial giving is part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Just giving regularly is part of being a disciple. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you should regularly give of your money for the sake of the kingdom. I believe this. I believe this strongly. Secondly, your giving is between you and God. All right? This is it. I think part of the problem of Ananias and Sapphira is is something I'll mention more in just a second. But I I think they saw Barnabas doing it. And they're like, well, he got the cool name. (laughs) I'm going to bring my stuff too. It's exactly the same story if you caught it. It's the same story of things going on there. It's just turned out differently. Like, like, did the apostles ask Barnabas how much he gave? No, there's a different thing happening here. I think they want an appearance of spirituality, which I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But your giving should be, be between you and God. Three, the bulk of your giving should be the local church. I believe this strongly. Now, are there needs in the world that are greater? Yes, there absolutely are. But why do I say your bulk of your giving should be the local church? Because it's prescribed and described in the book of Acts. This is the way people gave. They brought their things to the church. And that was a great way of God's mission reaching the world. And so a bulk of our giving as followers, as disciples of Jesus Christ should be to our local church. All right, whatever local church that is, whether you're a, a, you consider yourself a regular attender and a, and a person of our family here at Imprint Church or the other church, wherever it is, the bulk of your giving should be your local church. Another thing I want you to be aware of real quick is this. You know there isn't a strict practice of tithing for New Testament believers? It's not like you can just say, oh, I can give 10% and that's all it is. Like the reason they did that in the Old Testament, to put it in kind of layman's terms, is because it was tax. That, that's kind of what the tithe was. Do you know the temple and everything that was going on in the Old Testament was a form of governance, was a form of of helping people get through life and planning all kinds of things. And so that 10% was kind of a tax for the Old Testament believers as they were building a theocracy within the context of the kingdom of Israel. And so they had this 10% as the minimum that they were supposed to give. I think what happens in the New Testament, it actually Jesus kind of turns up the heat a little bit on giving and talks a little bit about heart and how we should give out of the abundance of our hearts. 
there's a sense that this is not just a strict practice of I'm going to give my 10% and then I'm done. That's all I have to give. Rather, the question should be, how am I being generous? Am I being generous with what God has given to me? And can I give in that way? That's a good question for us to think about. And then finally, here's something I just want you to know practically, and that's this. When you actually do give to Imprint Church, you're giving to support the work of the gospel both here and around the world. It's amazing, friends. You know you gave some $30,000 last year to build a garden in Rwanda. And you fed students in a school there in, in Bujasera, Rwanda, 18,000 meals with that money that you gave. That's a lot of money that you gave. And it's amazing to see that. I was there firsthand just a couple months ago. I was standing on the ground there in Rwanda, and I got to see the garden that you gave to, that you built, that is feeding these children in Rwanda. And now they're building a high school in the backyard there at the church, and it's amazing to see what they're doing. And I'm so grateful for that. It's going to the work of church planning. You want to hear a secret? Church planning is crazy expensive. (laughs) It just is, all right? And we're going to plant a church, and it's crazy for us to think about doing this. I think there's going to be like 60 of you that's going to go with Tom, I think. And, and so I'll have to work on getting my emotional levels okay, you know, and things like that. No, I'll, I'm really excited if you want to go. I totally am. But here's the thing. It's expensive for us to do that, but it's going to the work of the gospel. Why are we planting a church? Because new churches bring in new believers. It's just that we've seen it happen, and it's a great thing to see that happen as well. And so we want to start new churches. So as you give to Imprint Church, you're supporting the work of the gospel, both here and throughout the world. We'll tell you more about what we spend all our money on in January if you come to our family, our family meeting, and we'll tell you all about that. You can ask about all those things, and that stuff is not hidden in any way, shape, or form. We tell you all about it if you want to know, and we're excited about the work that you've given to as we get to be a part of the church together. But will you think about being a sacrificial, generous person? This creates the church that you want. This creates the Acts 432 church that we want, where we're of one heart and one soul, right? If you want that, you need to be generous. But then what comes next in Acts is pretty crazy. It's that story that I have to go back to that I was trying to ignore for the last 10 minutes or so. But let's jump into it. It's the contrast of Ananias and Sapphira. Again, I find this story immensely difficult, and I have to be honest with that. To lie about the sale of a piece of real estate that is essentially theirs in the first place and to drop dead because you lied about it, seems like a little intense, honestly. I mean, that is, I think I've done worse in church, honestly. Like, right? Like, oh my gosh, this is just intense. But I wrestle with even asking that, because then I realize how, how flippantly sometimes I take sin. Like, this is the same sin that Jesus Christ was crucified for, that he died on the cross for to set people free from. And no sins are different in the eyes of God. This is something crazy to think about. We might just think, man, they didn't kill anyone in the church. Yeah, but did they sin? From the context of the scripture, we we see that they did. It's like Annabelle's story here. Like, I didn't have sex. I didn't do drugs. I didn't do all those things. But I didn't have time for God. Were all those things sin? Yeah. And when you think about this story of the context of Ananias and Sapphira, we realize how flippantly we view sin in our own lives. And if this really happened, which I believe it did, then there's something about sin that we don't understand, especially if we balk at it. How could God do that? How in the world would he make that possible? Well, that's why Jesus was sent. That's why he died on the cross. Now, think about this. Luke didn't include every story in the early church. This would have been one I would have not included if I was writing the book of Acts. And it wouldn't have to deal with it 2,000 years later for the preachers at Imprint Church, you know. He's already shown the struggles from persecution outside the church. He's shown the victory that God has given them in various ways. So why would he write this? And I have a thought for you today. And here's my thought. I think Luke included this story for us. And I think that is because the greatest hindrance to the advancement of the gospel will never be outside the church it will always be inside the church. Does that make sense? I think when we think about the advancement of the gospel and the church and the world and the things that are going on in the world, it's not so much that the outside world is fighting against us. And funny, friends, Christians, we think about that stuff all the time. Oh man, if the culture would just do this. No man, if you know whatever it is. And I I read Acts and I go, well, no man, the church grew under persecution. The church was doing amazing in the midst of all the culture was fighting against them. And it just grew. I think people just, just bucked up. This is amazing. We're, we're in this movement of God and no one can stop us no matter what happens. 
to see the greatest hindrance of things that can happen to the church is not outside it, but it's inside it, friends. It's you and I. It's not being generous. It's not being of one heart and one spirit and one mind as we see, as we see in Acts chapter 4. Luke highlights this story for us to guard against the impurity of the church. I think we need to think about this in terms of our own lives. What are we doing? Are we helping the health of the church? Are we hindering the health of the church? Because we can hinder the advancement of the gospel by things happening within these doors more than what happens outside these doors against us. So the reason I'd say this is this passage just teaches us some things about our church. So what do we learn about Ananias and Sapphira? What do we learn here? I have some thoughts here. Number one, we see the seriousness of sin. That's what we see. This is the thing that can fight against the church the most, is sin within the context of the church. It can create major problems within the life of the church, whether that be gossip, whether that be sexual immorality, whether that be whatever it is, it can create major problems within the context of the church. And this context here was lying, simply lying and and not being who you are, trying to be uber spiritual and not being that, not being who you say you are. So my question for us today is how serious do we take sin? Do we take it seriously? Jesus died for all the sins, not just the bad ones, not just the ones you label as bad in your head. Number two, this passage teaches us about the holiness of God. Like honestly, friends, I would not be surprised if this story showed up in the Old Testament. And if it showed up in the Old Testament, I'd be able to explain it to you. Oh, it's the progress of redemption, friends. Like, you know, God in the Old Testament, his judgment showed up often, but then Jesus showed up and everything changed. And I'm like, crud, this is in the middle of the New Testament church, you know? This is what's happening right then. It's the same God, same one who's doing the same work. He's still holy. He's still against sin. And we see that in the context of the New Testament church. And the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost, all that kind of stuff, the amazing things happening, we see here the seriousness of God's attitude towards sin, and we get the holiness of God in there. Dennis Johnson, in his commentary on Acts that I read, he said this, if we are shocked by what God does here, we have actually fallen into sin. Which I had to read that twice. I was like, what? Can I be shocked about that whole thing? He says, we've fallen into sin because we have failed to appreciate the holy character of God. It's a good word for us. It's a good word for us. Number three, the fear of God. What do we learn from Ananias and Sapphira? The fear of God. It says here, the great fear came upon the whole church. Doesn't this story make you tremble just a little bit? Maybe it should. Maybe it should make us tremble just a little bit. Like, what are we hiding? What are we lying about? What have we not brought before the Lord? Now, is it ever right to be afraid of God? It's a good question. You might say, after all, I'm a I'm forgiven, I'm a child of God, all those kind of things, and I have peace with God, and I would say yes and amen to all of those things. I would say as a child of God, you have nothing to fear when it comes to God's judgment. But here's the other side of things. If you have no reason to be afraid, then don't be afraid. But if you're living like Ananias and Sapphira are, then maybe there is a sense of being able to say, okay, Lord, I need to take you a little more seriously than I do right now. I need to understand what you're trying to speak to me and not ignore you. I'm not living in defiance of you anymore and understand that God doesn't see this or God doesn't hear us. God's not concerned with my actions or things like that. If we don't have these things, then we don't have a healthy fear of the Lord. And a fear doesn't mean you're afraid that he's just going to punish you in any way. It's just a sense of saying, I am in awe of what you can do. And I am in awe of your character and your just judgments. The Bible even tells us in Proverbs chapter 9, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, right? That's what we see. Reformed theologian, famous Reformed theologian, R.C. Sproul, talks about the fear of God, but he defines it a little differently, which I think is beautiful. He defines it as living our lives quorum Deo, which is a Latin phrase that simply means before the face of God, is what he means by that. And I think it's beautiful. He says the phrase um, comes in the idea that we are in the presence of or before the face of God. He says to live quorum Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, and to the glory of God. I think that's what it means to fear the Lord is that you recognize at all times you are under the watch of God. Not in the bad way, it's going to push you or get mad at you, but just know he's there. He's watching you. He's watching your attitude and the things that are going on. And there's not just little and big sins, as we talked about before, but there's a sense that God sees all things. Not in a bad way, but in a way that just gives you that sense like, oh yeah, God is real and he really does judge sin. Number four, finally, is this thing that I've referred to already. The unhealthy appearance of spirituality. What do we learn from Ananias and Sapphira? The unhealthy appearance of spirituality. 
These people wanted to look spiritual, but in reality they were not. We understand here that you can almost simulate holiness, right? They looked really good from the outside. I, I don't know. I, again, I said earlier that probably the church knew these people. And so if I saw them coming up and giving money from land, and I didn't know the whole story, I'd be like, dude, those people are so spiritual. Man, way better than I ever am, you know? And yet, what was in their hearts? What was really going on there? There was deception there. There was lying that was happening there. Somewhere along the way, Ananias and Sapphira believed that Christianity was about religious regulations, doing things on the outside for an appearance of spirituality, a perception of what the church views you as, rather than allowing their hearts to be changed. And this is not authentic Christianity. Simulated holiness misses the entire point of Christianity, my friends. And this contrast comes in the form of Barnabas, who authentically gave what God gave him as a way to be a part of the church. So here's a practical question to ask as we come to Ananias and Sapphira. As we look at these things, we ask ourselves, do I value my spiritual appearance more than I value spiritual authenticity? Do I take sin seriously? Do I understand the holiness of God? Do I live a little bit in this sense of awe and wonder of who God is and what he does and what he sees in my life? Those are good questions. Those, my friends, will keep you from walking on a path of sin at times and will keep you from trying to be this holy person that really you are not. And so my hope is that we learn something from this so we don't become a church that's unhealthy from the inside and allow the church not to advance in the movement of the gospel to the outside. What's amazing is kind of what happens next in the context of Acts chapter 5. Because we see in Acts chapter 5 verses 12 through 32 is that there's this crazy moment where the apostles are taken once again. And we get this idea that it's more of them. That they're taken this time and they're thrown in jail once again. And why? Because they're speaking the name of Jesus Christ again. And we see this in these chapters. I'm not, I'm not going to read them because we don't have enough time to read them, but you can read them later if you want to. But the crazy thing is that we think the church is probably growing and more things are happening because what happens is we see in Acts 5.20 that they're speaking what's called the words of life. And then in Acts 5.30, Peter stands up and he shares another gospel message. And it says, Where the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree, God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel, the forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. Thrown in jail, Peter stands up and preaches the gospel once again. Where have we heard this before? Oh, last chapter. <laughs> P- Peter can't get away from this one-trick pony of preaching the gospel, of proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ over and over again to the people. And what's amazing is the people still respond in a way that is totally unforeseen. It gets worse. In fact, in Acts chapter 5, the Bible tells us they were so angry that they wanted to kill the apostles. So it's moved from just anger, what do we do with these people, to let's kill these men. They cannot shut up about speaking the name of Jesus Christ. And so they're so frustrated about this. And so we get to the very end of the book here, the very end of the chapter, excuse me, in Acts 5.33, and I do want to read this part to you, and we see what happens. Because we see here, the Bible says this, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up claiming to be somebody and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For this plan or if this undertaking is a man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found over, over, excuse me, opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. More preaching, more preaching of Jesus, more abuse that the disciples and apostles and early church members faced, and they were excited about this thing. And then we see at the very end, they're trying to figure out what to do. What do we do with this church? It's growing. Even though people are dying in their doorsteps, even though they're sharing all their, they're still growing and things are going amazing. And they don't know what to do. They want to kill them. They're so frustrated. So this man, Gamaliel, the elder, stands up. 
Many of us might recognize Gamaliel as the guy who eventually discipled a man named, or did disciple a man named Saul of Tarsus, who eventually became Paul, the Apostle Paul. And Gamaliel was his teacher and leader and his Pharisee that was over him. And Gamaliel was obviously wise in the land and they took his advice. But what I want to learn from Gamaliel is something really interesting. Do you notice about this man that he kind of never makes his mind up about who Jesus is? This is, the, this is how I'm going to leave you today as we jump into a time of response. Because I look at this thing and I see Gamaliel's life and I see that we might think of him as the tolerant, cautious man who's like, I'm not making up my mind right now. I need more evidence. I need to figure this whole thing out. But, you know, I don't want to oppose God, so I'm going to kind of live on the fence a little bit. You know what's crazy? We never hear about Gamaliel again. We, we never hear about him in the book of Acts. We, we learn everything we know about Gamaliel extra-biblically. We find out stuff outside of the Bible. Why? Maybe because he's a guy that never made a choice to follow Jesus. We don't know. We don't know what happened to him. But I think what we see here is this ambivalence does not lead to him becoming part of what God wants to do in his life. What's amazing is one more contrast here is between him, who's the man who is just the one who says, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm ambivalent towards the gospel, towards Jesus. I'm going to be on the fence. It might be of God. It might not be of God. And then the apostles who are, who are rejoicing that they were beat and counted worthy for suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. And they just went out and preached him often. Friends, is our Christianity so weak today? I'm like, man, I, I can't believe these stories as I think about this. I don't want to be ambivalent Gamaliel. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be more like the church that's, that's trying to sacrifice, that's being generous, the ones who are, are killing our sins, who are fearing the Lord, who are walking with Him, who are not just trying the outside of appearance of spirituality, but inwardly our hearts are being changed by Christ so that we can be people who are witnesses like this, where we go day to day and house to house preaching the name of Jesus Christ. Do you know the first verse of chapter 6 says, now in these days, the disciples were increasing in number. That's the next thing that happens. Right after the crisis of chapter 5, I just read to you Ananias and Sapphira. How many of you be like, I'm done, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to find some other social club to be a part of to now. <laughs> this was fine for now, but I'm, I'm done. How many of us would just back out from that? How many of us would back out from what was happening to the apostles when they were beaten because of preaching the name of Jesus Christ? So my challenge is we turn to response today is that what do we do with the message of Ananias and Sapphira? What do we do with the message of the early church? It is up to you. Your chance today is to be a person who's part of the church that says, I want to be generous. I want to take sin serious. I want to do all these things we talked about, which I know was a lot today. And I know, I know it was just something, as I, I read the scripture this week, I was compelled by this. But I want us to be thinking about and evaluating our own lives and where we're at. Are we a part of the church that's growing through the gospel of Jesus Christ, allowing Jesus to be the center of all we do as a church? Are we doing that? Or are we just the appearance of spirituality? Is there things inside the church or inside our own hearts that are causing the problems and not just stuff that's outside of the church? These are all good questions to come to the Lord with today. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing some songs. The band's going to come back up here. And as they sing, I would encourage you to think about your own life, to be challenged by these words that are happening in Acts 4 and 5. And to ask the Lord if, if he's speaking to you about something and to allow him to change you by the Holy Spirit. You're welcome to pray during this time. You can pray at any point during the songs. Uh, there's people in the back who'd be willing to pray for you as well. They have prayer tags on. They'd be happy to pray for you if you need prayer. And then as I mentioned earlier, you're welcome to come forward any time and give. There's baskets in the front that you can give and be generous for. And then, and then finally, you can take communion. We have our Lord's Supper. We offer every Sunday here at Imprint Church. And you're welcome to come forward during the songs and take the bread and dip that in the cup and receive that by faith. The Bible says to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a way of, of saying, I'm, I'm in. I want, I want to be part of this thing. And maybe today, as you just evaluate your lives through this grid of what I gave you, which I know is a lot of grid, maybe before you come take communion, just tell the Lord, okay, Lord, I'm in. I, I want this. I want to be generous. I want to take sin. I want to do all of these things that you're speaking to me today. And then come and receive communion by faith as you do that. Will you pray about these things with me? God, thanks for your word, the life as we see in Acts 5, verse 20. This is the life. The, the, the apostles' lives were completely changed by what you said. I mean, Peter sold a business and a fishing business to go and follow you, and he never went back. I, I mean, these people's whole perspective of everything was changed. And Lord, I, I would just pray that that would be us, 
that you would help us to have this perspective of what do you want to do, Lord, in us, to help us live the life that you're calling us to do. And Lord, as we take this kind of sobering passage today and we absorb it into our minds, Lord, would you change us? Would you help us to be people that actually live differently because of it? God, we love you. I'm thankful for your word this morning. And as you speak to us through it, Lord, I pray that you'd change us, that we would be people that indeed fear you, that we are killing sin, that we don't want this appearance of spirituality, that we want to be generous. These are all big, big things for us, Lord. So would you give us the grace to do it? And as we worship, Lord, we commit ourselves to doing those things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.